One of the biggest problems facing the legitimate cannabis business is that big banks and creditors are still hesitant to get involved for fear that they could be violating certain federal laws. In part two of our interview with Giada DeCarcer of New Frontier Financials, she spoke with us about the current legislative efforts to address that problem. We've been hearing a lot about people having problems with banks, um, for instance, processing credit cards, stuff like that, because they're worried about uh, contradiction with federal law. Um, do you see uh, in the near future a solution to that or are people starting to kind of loosen the stigma or anything like that? So it's a massive problem. Uh, I mean, literally during tax season in Colorado, you saw folks showing up with suitcases of cash, which is not very safe uh, and certainly does not help regulators track exactly how much they should be taxing. Right. It doesn't look legit. It does not. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, it is a massive problem. In terms of um, solutions, well, it just happens that about 10 days ago, there was a banking bill introduced on the Hill. Um, and what that is looking to do is to, um, they don't want to allow federal money to be spent into punishing banking institutions that may want to do business with cannabis operators if they're licensed and it's all legal. Um, not really sure what will happen to it, but the word out in DC is that it's the most promising bill to date. So does that mean that, um, that now the bankers will be confident that they can handle cannabis-related funds without the federal government going after them? Sort of. So about a year ago when I looked into this, um, I actually interviewed a couple of, of banks uh, in New York as well as in D.C. and I wanted to understand why this big issue, because the more I looked into it, a, a state-regulated bank should be able, if in the state it's legal, the state bank should be able to take on deposit and, and, and process payments. So the answer I received was that the issue wasn't so much the FDIC, which may or may not want to ensure that deposit, but the biggest issue was the FDIC regulation, whereby compliance is extremely costly on the bank side. So the bank feels that they end up being an investigative service provider rather than a banking solution. So it's literally prohibitive to them, uh, too expensive to open an account. So with, with this bill, I think that, and, and I don't have all the intricate details of the bill, I myself have not read it, but my understanding is that it would sort of alleviate some of that very intrusive compliance requirement and maybe will be less prohibitive to banks at the state level. So do you uh, expect that this bill is going to pass? Or? Well, the, the Republican Party, or at least those folks that we've talked to, have said that they really don't, they're not interested in, in taking a position for or against it. Um, the cannabis industry today is a $4.7 billion industry. We forecast it to reach over $15 billion by 2020. A lot of people want to make money. So it looks like there's not going to be a lot of opposition, um, but on the Hill you can really never tell what's going to happen. Another interesting bill that was introduced um, recently is the, car uh, the carriage bill, which is looking to declassify cannabis as a Schedule One drug down to a Schedule Three. That would also have an impact on banks' ability to sort of mitigate the regulatory um, requirements around payment processing as well as taking in deposits. She also had some helpful advice about the differences between the medical side of the cannabis business and the recreational side. So it looks like as uh, the cannabis business is maturing, it's kind of splitting into two factions. There's the recreational business and there's the medical business. What kinds of factors should investors be considering when they're deciding whether they want to invest in the recreational side or the medical side? Excellent question. Um, well, let's see. <clears throat> if the state, um, well, first of all, in most, most cases um, that we think were successful in adopting both, we've seen medical marijuana being legalized before recreational. And the reason why that's important is because it builds sort of that knowledge base and that infrastructure for the state to then move on to recreational side of things. Um, so from an investor perspective, what that means is, um, you know, for instance, a state like Oregon, where they're going straight to recreational, well, how fast are they going to really become efficient and how high is that quality going to be right off the bat when we're talking about super nascent? There really is nothing, there's no history behind it. So that will be a factor. Um, another factor is what I mentioned earlier. Um, has home growth already been legalized? Uh, and if that's the case, and in medical, in oftentimes, 
um, licenses that have been given out to individuals in the home, on the home growth, obviously, is for medical use. Well, if there's a large uh, home growing base um, of medical marijuana production and you're about to legalize recreational, that's going to impact which you invest in. Because we have found, for instance, in Arizona, when they legalized recreational, or I'm sorry, when they legalized the retail, um, they gave out retail licenses, it decreased the homegrown um, sector by 95%. So that's significant. Um, so that's another factor to look into, home growth versus retail. Um, other than that, the qualifying conditions. How many qualifying conditions are there in any given state and, and how strict are they? That, that would impact sort of the ability of the medical uh, portion of the industry to sort of bloom uh, and, and compete against recreational. But ultimately, what we have found is that um, whenever you have medical and then recreational comes on board, there is a significant pull away from medical into the recreational side of the market. Our mission is to raise visibility into this amazing space and, and to make it more transparent for new investors to come in and have a little more security on, in terms of what they're investing in and for operators to be able to compete in a healthy manner. And ultimately what you need for that is data, good data.